probably seven to 10 minutes, seven to 10 minutes, allow people to, to kind of filter on. Um, as you can see, I got my two guest speakers as well, Forrest, Abnamia, Matthew, Malikul. Um, you know, give you guys a little quick rundown on these guys. I'll, I'll be getting more into that here in a minute, but uh, let's get, we're gonna give it a few minutes for people to um, matriculate on the call and uh, excited to speak with everybody tonight. Um, I had a good bit of interest uh, coming on here. So yeah, kind of take it from there, man. So you said, Matthew, you had to get the grass cut before uh, everything uh, everything changed, huh? I know, that was interesting. I, I I really hurt my shoulder last night trying to get it started. You talking about pulling the, uh, the court? Yep. <laughs> Because it would not start for some reason. And I think I ended up like flooding the carburetor. And then I just kept trying and trying it. And then even this morning, I woke up. First thing I did, I, I went and started it, tried to start it, went and start. And then, uh, and then just like an hour later, it starts working. So it's crazy. All right. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. So yeah, so that's super fun. So uh, right now, I think Forrest is actually in uh, Colorado. Uh, is that right, Forrest? Yeah, that's right. I'm just here for a few days. So just checking out some of the sites. Um, today, I actually went to this place called Meow Wolf. Okay. And maybe you guys have heard of it, maybe not, but it was super cool. It was a big art installation and just some of the coolest nicest art if you're in columbus other world that one's kind of similar but this meow wolf um it was like on another level totally yeah man that's cool that's cool so yeah this is this is uh really my my first webinar man uh doing some type of educational piece so i'm excited for everybody joining i also think that you're actually gonna learn some good stuff tonight um we've uh we've went over this presentation a couple times i'm gonna share force is gonna share uh, Matthew's going to share. And I think for experienced investors and especially new investors, it's going to be valuable, valuable information. So I think it's going to be good. We're just going to give it a few more minutes uh, for people to, to get on. People just get off work or whatever the situation may be. If they're having trouble logging on, this gives them a second to, to work through that. So uh, just bear with us as, uh, as we wait on that. Let's see here. Somebody just emailed me. So I'm emailing them back about how to get on. Here we go. Here we go. And then uh, if anybody's got any specific questions regarding how real estate is a tax benefit or any, any type of question like that, drop it in the comments as well. Uh, so that we might be able to address that while we're while we're speaking. All right, let me here we go. We got somebody else just just logged on. So we're giving it about seven to ten minutes for people to log on. Here, what's going on, Ellis? I hope all is well. David, I hope you're doing well. Nada, Valerie, Christopher, Annie, Adrian, I hope you're doing well. I'm gonna give about seven to eight minutes uh, for people to get on. It's so around seven eight, seven oh eight, seven ten. We'll get started on the presentation and uh, kind of go from there. So let's see here. Just answer a few people's questions that they might have had. So I think it's going to be some good, good information going on here. Okay, here we go. And some more people. Are right, we? Yeah, we got some more people joining us right now. Kim, Laura. Okay. Do you specialize in cost savings and investors? When can they be utilized correctly? Adrian, that's a great question. Matthew is actually going to get into that in the presentation. Appreciate that question, Adrian. That's a really good one, actually. Um, 
so yeah, we're, we're definitely going to address that cost segregation study question for sure. Um, let's go ahead. I'm just answering a few emails for people that that were that were asking me some questions about getting on. Let me uh, let me go ahead and get some more people. What's going on, Jacob? Hope all is well. Let's do it. All right, let's see here. Kim, hope you're doing good. Jacob, hope you're doing good. Uh, I think it's MK. Hope you're doing well as well. About to get started here in just a few minutes. Laura, about to get started here in a few minutes. Um, we've got, just gonna wait three or four more minutes before we get started, allow a few more people to jump on because we're gonna share some very, very important yet good information for new investors, for experienced investors. We're gonna try to cover some things across the board that you may know, may not know, um, but also to uh, making sure that uh, you, you just reminded of it. You know, I feel like, you know, I learned some things over and over again, and then sometimes it takes time for it to finally like click in, right? So I think that's one thing that's really important about um, hearing information as often and as good as you can. And I think right now we're about to drop some good information on people. Here we go. Here we go. Here hey, we Donald, go. how are you doing? Hey, what's going on, Trevor? How are you doing? I'm good. Good, good, good. I doubt you remember me, but I think I met you one one time. I think I came to one of your wholesales. Um, so good to see you again. Good to see you as well, man. Yep. Cool, 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 cool. That's good. All right, guys, just want to let you know we're, we're going to uh, give it just a few more minutes, allow a few more people to get on. Trevor, good to see you. Alex, good to see you as well. We've got a few more people getting on. I'm going to just give it two, three more minutes, and then we're going to just jump into the information, um, as well as kind of give you background on everybody on the call. As you see, uh, Matthew Maliku is a licensed CPA as well as uh, Forrest Abnamia, the CFO, which is Chief Financial Officer Services for Multinational Corporations and Small Businesses. And um, uh, they're going to be speaking along with me. I'm going to start and then Forrest is going to follow and Matthew will be last. And then we're going to have questions at the end, as well as as we're going along with the presentation, feel free to definitely drop questions in the chat box, in the, in the chat area. Yeah, we're getting a lot of people jumping on right now. So good thing we waited. Um, just don't want anybody to miss anything. Want to make sure that we're all here. We're able to, to definitely connect and uh, connect as a community. Adrian's already asked a question that Matthew would definitely address. He said, hello, everyone. Do you specialize in cost segregation studies? And as an investor, what can they do to be utilized correctly? That's a good one. I love that. So we're definitely going to jump into that as well. Tony, what's going on? Todd Jackson, what's going on? I got a phone number on here. I don't know who that is quite, quite yet. I think Adrian left and came back. That's cool. What's going on, man? Good to see you, brother. Oh, we got a lot of people jumping on. Good thing we waited, guys. Good thing we waited. Appreciate everybody that was on here early as well. I want to make sure that I uh, just acknowledge you and thank you for your time, for hopping on early and just with, bearing with me. There we go. Look like Joel's at the gym. What's going on, Joel? <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. All right, guys. One more minute. I'm about to get things started off. I'm going to speak first um, and then Forrest and then Matthew. Just give you a quick background on those guys again. Uh, Forrest does Chief Financial Officer uh, Services for multinational corporations and for uh, small businesses. Matthew is an investor. Matthew Malik was an investor as well as a uh, licensed CPA. So he's gonna be giving us the license information. Uh, I got you, MK, I got you. Appreciate you, man, appreciate you. I see what you're saying there. All right, guys, without further ado, I think we're gonna go ahead and start. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my presentation. And then after that, I'm gonna allow uh, Forrest and Matthew to, to share their presentations as well. So uh, by the way, everybody, this is my first time hosting a educational webinar for other people. I've attended many, many, many courses, many, many presentations. 
And I'm um, looking to have this wrapped up around 8, 8, 15. So if you got other things you got to do with your night, um, you know, this will be recorded. We'll put it on YouTube as well. But uh, I'm going to try to allow anybody else that jumps in uh, onto the call. So let's, let's jump into some things here. All right. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So just to give everybody a little background on me, I'm Donald Payne Jr. Um, I've been in the real estate business for 10 years now. Um, I work with my dad at a company and my mom at a company called Vision Realty. My dad's been a real estate agent 42 years and uh, this year is my 10th year. I've done well over a thousand transactions and that's on market and off market combined, uh, wholesaling, uh, flipping, uh, being a realtor. I've always been a full-time realtor since I got started, as well as at my first three years, I had a night job at night taking care of the mentally disabled. Um, so well over $100 million worth of real estate, and I've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in my real estate education. You know, I think it's important to get educated. I think it's important to, to perfect your craft. This is something that you're going to move forward with or take seriously uh, in life. And I just, I just really believe in the power of continuing education. And so when I started, you know, also to something that's not on here, I've helped hundreds of investors um, become proficient in investing, right? And that might be helping them do the first deal, do multitude of deals, um, just people I've sold property to or just help educate it in just different ways. And um, plenty, plenty of stories in and around Columbus, if you're in the Columbus area about that. So I wanna kind of share the reason why I wanted to do this. Uh, originally, I had this idea of like, you know, it was around tax time and I was thinking about, man, it took me seven years to buy my first or to refinance my first rental property. Right. I've been in the business 10 years. So hundreds of properties. But why couldn't I refinance a property? Why didn't I have the income? Actually, let me somebody in real quick. Sorry. Why didn't I have the income? And why didn't I, um, you know, uh, Sorry, got a little distracted. Let somebody in. Why didn't I, why didn't I do some things properly in order to do that? And so, for anybody out there that's trying to refinance or they're working on the the Burr method or anything like that, I think this this call, I think this information is for you, right? I think anybody that's uh, trying to figure out how to do their taxes properly, but also get tax benefits, also write off some expenses, but then be able to acquire property through financing, this is this is for you. And so anybody that just wants to know more before they jump in, this is for you. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, things that I learned during that first seven years that helped me kind of my career go like this and then ultimately take off more as I was able to finance more homes. Oh, OK, yeah. So this is uh, Ray Brown is a, a famous developer, and he always said the best time to buy a house is always five years ago. And I think about the time in which I got started was 2012. And imagine if I was able to have bought and held on to homes 2012 through even 2018, 18, 19, when I actually started financing them, you know, how many houses or how much I would have been. But I actually don't think about it like that. I think about that everything's in a learning journey. I learned it in my time, in my season for a reason, right? But I'm trying to teach you and tell you something ahead of time told to you early right so that if you're brand new or if you're already experienced you're trying to refinance or you're trying to buy with private money fix it up refinance it and, and do a perfect burr I, I want to let you know that you can definitely do it but also too that um you know there's a certain way that you need to go about it so one of the biggest reasons why i wasn't able to to, to buy those properties because i was i had read rich that poor that and i love that book so much i read it when i was 15 when i was 21 I read it when I was 25. I reread it like every probably two to three years. And I kind of learned something new every time, right? And one of the biggest things was that I, I heard as a business owner that it's good to write off your income or write off expenses and not pay taxes. And I think that that's one of those things when you're a young entrepreneur, when your business revenue is under 500,000 or so, you know, you got to be really, really careful with that because my tax returns had low profits. Even though I was making money because of mileage, expenses and other expenses i was able to write it off to where i didn't pay barely any taxes and i didn't have the right accountant or even the right lender partner telling me the right thing to do and so i wanted to make sure that you guys are told the right thing to do or have that information so that you make sure that you go ahead and, and do the right thing with your taxes so that you can finance because it's like this the four thousand or eight thousand dollars i didn't pay in taxes versus the hundreds of thousands of dollars 
and the real estate I could have owned and the cash flow I could have received, you know, what was what was the trade off? It was probably better for me to pay the taxes or pay a higher taxes. So um, and, or, or let me say it better like this. Claim a higher income and then pay more taxes. So Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt said real estate cannot be lost or stolen, nor can it be carried away. Purchase with common sense, paid for in full, and manage with reasonable care. It is about the safest investment in the world. Real estate is very, very solid, very, very good investment. And the more you own, I mean, the better it can be for you if you can manage it properly. So I'm telling you, one of, one of the key things is going to be finding the right accountant to work with. Somebody that has invested in real estate or is very investor or real estate friendly is super key, right? I, I had, I probably had four or five uh accountants in my career at this point my first one he was mainly focused on like stocks and just other stuff and he was an old guy so i figured he just knew a lot of stuff and but but never really provided his advice for me always wanted me to pay at least amount of taxes and even one year he didn't even file my taxes i came to find out in 2019 that he didn't file my 2017 and so that was a that was a whole mess so it's one of those things where you gotta you gotta be paying attention at this part of your business some of us are really good at finding deals, flipping deals, raising money, but we got to pay attention to our books. Another thing that's really important that I ended up doing as well was hiring a bookkeeper, right? And a bookkeeper, I actually found them on Upwork, right? Or, your, or uh, the accountant offers that service for additional money. What that is, is let's say you got, and Matthew and, and Forrest are going to jump more into this, but you got QuickBooks hooked up to your book, bank account. Well, they're categorizing the, the, the transactions based on projects or based on whatever. It's just something that really, really helped me stay on top of my books. Because at the end of the year, instead of giving my accountant a whole shoebox full of receipts, I was able to give him a, a somewhat organized you know, picture that he was able to put together and piece together the rest of the pieces, right? Versus a whole disorganized mess that takes a lot of time and costs me a lot of money to get worked on. So a famous Hebrew proverb is, he's not a full man who does not own a piece of land. I think it kind of rhymes, right? And I think that we, uh, we all want to own something, right? And I think it's very important how our taxes are done in order to be, in order to, be able to finance something. So one of, one of the books that really was revolutionary for me and my dad, for you, those of you that like to read, uh, is this book called Profit First. If you haven't heard of this book, I would suggest that you get on Amazon right now or shortly after we present this stuff and get the book, maybe $10. But it taught me a couple key things, right? Um, one of those key things was that I generally would just have one bank account. You know, I flip, I'd wholesale, whatever. And I have one or two bank accounts, right? With that money in it. So when I looked in that account and I say, man, I got some money or man, I need to go make some money, right? Well, what that book taught me was I need to have five accounts, profit, income, you know, owner's compensation, um, taxes so i make sure i was always putting away money for taxes and then uh finally operating expenses right and so uh it's one of those things where you you, you got to be able to separate out your money and take away for taxes and some of us you know we either somebody taught us that already but for me you know i started in a real estate when i was 20 years old right my dad had been doing it forever but we're we're it was really still the recession when i got started so it was a time where you know, I still had to go seek education and educate myself on certain aspects and facets of the business, right? Because just because somebody told me something or my dad may have told me doesn't mean that I have fully listened. Sometimes, you know, you got you to gotta get a couple of speed knots in your head. You got to go through some, some situations or challenges to realize, you know what, I need to save for taxes or I need to save, uh, for pro save my profits and put it in a different account so I don't see it, so I don't spend it. Right. And, you know, you might not be spending on a bad thing. You might be spending it on buying another deal. But I would tell you that being able to stand up, caught up with your taxes uh, is something that a lot of business owners end up getting behind on and owing the government a lot of money, which can definitely inhibit your ability. So John Paulson is actually a, a big hedge fund manager and uh, which own, his REIT owns a lot of real estate, as well as they do a lot of um, uh, stocks and, and bond trading. He said, if you don't own a home, buy one. If you own a home, buy another. If you own two homes, buy a third and lend to your relatives the money to buy a home, right? I just, I think that's why this real estate game is just so important, right? So I wanna tell you the quick story of Paul and Sherry. Paul and Sherry are some good friends of mine as well as uh, clients. And they, I, I met Paul and Sherry maybe uh, 
virtually about six, seven months ago. And when I told Paul and Sherry that I was going to host this class, they said, Donald, you got to do it. You, you got to do it. Because Paul and Sherry probably own 60, 70 plus houses around uh, the U.S., some Indy, some Columbus now, some in Arizona. And they said, hey, you know what? We want to we wanna come to Columbus. We want to buy some, some real estate. So they stuck around for a couple of weeks. We went and looked at a bunch of houses. They were able to get five homes in, I think, three weeks, even in this crazy market. I mean, this they literally, we just closed on one of the, the other homes today but it's one of those things where you know when you have your taxes situated and you understand the model of how to buy and acquire homes and the banks are very willing to work with you you can be able to pick up velocity very quickly on your purchases right and so they they essentially bought you know five properties from they got them in three weeks but you know it takes about another two months to close or 45 days to close so yeah so with that being said, I'm going to take the presentation and I'm going to have Forrest share. Give me a second to go ahead and transition over the screen. And um, again, we're going to be taking some questions, uh, plenty of questions, trying to answer as many as we can toward the end of our presentations. Forrest is a uh, CFO, Chief Financial Officer for multinational corporations, as well as small business owners. He's going to jump into some very detailed yet good information uh, for you on how to run your business properly your p ls and things like that nature so that you and your accountant know what your business is going on and then matthew's going to speak from there he's our certified public accountant let me go ahead and uh have uh forrest hop on give me one second okay Let's all see. right donald thank you let me make you the host real quick there you go forrest it's all you all right let me share my screen here Presentation. And you should be able to see my presentation up and running. Let's see, it's loading. All right, while that's loading, I just want to uh, thank Donald for putting this together. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed about Donald, I've known him for about a year now, is that he's just really consistent guy. And the fact that he's putting this together and just, you know, offering some information, something I'm totally behind, um, super excited about. I think uh, Donald on the real estate side, excellent, excellent information. Um, and then you're going to have Matt coming up soon and giving you some great information as well. Um, is my uh, screen just showing black or are you able to see um, the presentation here? Hold on one second. I apologize for this, everyone. This did not happen in our rehearsal earlier. I'm going to do it like this. I'm not going to do full screen. All right. Can you guys see this now? And Donald, you might be muted so i don't know if you're able to respond to that um can someone respond like can you see my screen we're good to go here okay all right i'm just gonna get going here guys let's do it so money management and your business using your Business as a wealth building vehicle. Um, this is just a disclaimer for informational purposes only. Uh, take what you want from this and uh, go um, get advice from your advisors accordingly. So my name is Forrest Abdemia. I am the founder and CEO of Simple Wealth Solutions. I'm an investor, business consultant, and financial educator. I've been consulting for well over a decade. Um, clients include individuals, small businesses, Fortune 500 companies and nonprofit organizations. So um, I've managed a $74 million account where we were um, really trying to strategize and grow our operations even more. Um, and what I'm really passionate about is um, helping my clients improve their uh, personal and their professional financial awareness. So I'm gonna get into some techniques and some principles here uh, that I think you will find interesting and hopefully take away um some good gems from this presentation and you'll have matthew coming up next with the tax specific points which you'll really enjoy as well 
Let's start out with Ray Dalio, founder of the world's largest hedge fund. He says, what most people and their countries want most is wealth and power. So if we're like most people, we probably want more wealth. We probably want more power. And money is the key critical tool that we really associate with wealth. And money allows us to have more buying power. And so what Ray also says about making wealth is that it is equal to being productive. So if we're creative, we're um, you know, improving real estate, whatever our business might be, being productive is really the key uh, ingredient. Over the long run, our wealth and our buying power uh, will be a function of how much we produce. So let's get into um, some basics here. Master the basics. And what are the basics of personal finance? And I would also consider in uh, business finance, uh, the two key tools are your balance sheet and your income statement. So I'm going to uh, consider these like the basic basics, and we want to master these. We want to get these as solid as possible. Um, some of you might be using your balance sheet and income statement for taxes, as well as business strategy. There's a lot you can do. Um, and when I was working um, in corporate, uh, I saw a lot of ins and outs of uh, these tools. So another principle, money is a game. And let's use our scorecards, the balance sheet. I would define as a snapshot of your score. And the income statement, I would define as the, uh, the map of uh, showing the incremental changes to your score of the balance sheet. So there's you personally, and there's your business. You personally have a balance sheet and income statement, and your business has a balance sheet and an income statement. And we're gonna dive into each of these individually. On um, The point I wanna just bring up right here is that there's a relationship between you and your business and getting clear on that relationship, I think is really key for a lot of small business owners, real estate investors. Um, even if you're just an employee, uh, salary or wage, like that's your business, there's a relationship there. And we wanna um, be able to map that out and create budgets and plans for our financial future. Let's dive into the first basic, the balance sheet. So, this is just a sample balance sheet, um, just generic uh, template here to give some ideas. A lot of you have seen this. Some of you, this might be a little bit newer, um, but the basics of this are on the left-hand side, you have your assets. You can see that green arrow on the left here. And on the right-hand side, you have your liabilities. Um, and the difference between your assets and liabilities is your equity. And in personal finance realm, we would call that your net worth. So, in this particular example, you can see the total assets is $910,000 um, between all of these different categories. And the liabilities we have is $450,000. And so that leaves on the equity equation, $460,000 and our liabilities plus our equities is equal to $910,000. It balances on the other side of the balance sheet. So assets equals liabilities plus equity. Now we'll get into these specific formulas um, next. So this is key, 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 critical tool number one, our balance sheet. Um, here again, reiterating, our personal net worth is our assets minus our liabilities, and our business equity is our assets minus our liabilities. Basic, 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 just making sure we understand how this tool functions. Now, one thing we can do when we're looking at book value or net worth or equity, some of these words kind of overlap, so you'll hear different people um, prefer to use different ones. But if our assets are greater than our liabilities, we would say I have a positive net worth or a positive book value. Um, and if our assets are less than our liabilities, then that means our debts are um, engulfing our assets. And this could lead to potential problems if um, left to continue in an asymmetrical relationship where we're just racking up more and more debt and is drowning out our income from our assets. Negative net worth typically is not the direction we want to go, especially if what we want is more wealth, more net worth, more equity, right? Let's go to this tool number two, income statement. Here's a sample income statement. You have your top line revenue, and then you can see at the very bottom arrow, the net income, net profit. Um, some of these lines have different uh, names depending on who your uh, accountant, um, what, what terminology your accountant likes to use. So you have your top line revenue, minus your cost of goods sold is equal to your gross profit. Then you have your operating expenses. Once you subtract that out, you'll get um, a, a line that some will call EBITDA, earnings before 
interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And that line is used a lot in valuating uh, businesses um, and how much they might trade for. And then you will have more um, line item deductions from their interest and then taxes. So this line I know is why a lot of us are on this call today. We wanna know how do we optimize what we're putting in to the tax line of our income statement. And Matthew's gonna get to that in his presentation. And then once you get to that bottom line, you have your net income. What uh, Donald was talking about in the profit first was in your operating expenses, making sure that you, the business owner, are putting money in your pocket um, before you um, pay your taxes. And then we don't wanna be left with nothing in our, in, our, in our pocket at the end of the day, right? We're in business because we want more wealth, we want more money, um, that's how it works. So let me give you a quick example here. So this is real world example. Here's Tesla's 10K report. You can pull up any of these reports for any publicly traded company. And in the 10K, there's a lot of different information. You can see there's a lot here um, that's in it, but zooming into item eight, they put in their financial statement. So my whole point here is we just went over the basics, balance sheet, income statement. Here's Tesla in their 10K. Here's their balance sheet. You can see their assets, 52 billion, and you can see it, um, the liabilities, 28 billion, plus their equity, 22 billion. Boom, you have it balancing on the other side, 52 billion as of this date, end of 2020. So there's their um, balance sheet. Here's their income statement. You got your revenues, you have your cost of revenues, there's your gross profit. Then here's your outcomes, your operating expenses. And then here's your net income was basically being added into the equity of uh, the company. And then we have at the bottom some specific things with how they're dealing with their shareholders and how much is going to them in the form of distributions, dividends, the, the such. So we just looked at Tesla's balance sheet. Here's their income statement. And this reflects the price of the stock or what it's perceived to be based on these, these books. So in private equity, re real estate investor land, we wanna be using these same basic tools to help us navigate what decisions we're making. So to wrap it up with Ray Dalio, and this will summarize everything that I just discussed. All entities, people, companies, nonprofit organizations, and governments deal with the same basic financial realities and always have. They have money that comes in, that's the revenue, and they have money that goes out, that's the expenses. And when netted, that makes up their net income. So these flows are measured in numbers that appear in income statements, which is what we just looked at. And all the entities, assets, and liabilities, that is, debts can be shown in this balance sheet. Whether it writes those numbers down or not, every country, company, nonprofit organization, and individual has these. So my point is you are a business, I am a business, our businesses are businesses, but us individually, we're entities with balance sheets and income statements, whether we write down these numbers or not. And I advocate what we write these down with my clients. This is one of the first things that we do is make sure we have our balance sheet and our income statement in place and we're actively using them to guide our futures. Um, just a little transition here uh, to wrap up. What is a business? So uh, Donald liked this one. So uh, essential business components um, can be simplified down into four different components in one particular model. I think you like this. So number one is your business model, your business idea. A lot of times these are industry specific. Um, that is key, key, key portion. Another key portion is the capital. So raising money to finance operations. Most money, most companies can't run without any money. It's like a car can't run without gas in the tank. We have to be able to finance our operations, raising money, raising capital, key, key component. Number three, monetization. Um, how, are, how is cash flow coming into the business? What are our revenue streams? And finally, for the systems that are running this whole thing, it could be labor, technology, processes, automation, et cetera. Um, so take this model for what it's worth. I think it's uh, very useful in uh, thinking about your business in these terms. Um, and this can be applied to real estate or any other business there. So the one common business issue I see is inadequate tracking and planning, hence the basics. And that is the theme of this presentation, balance sheet income statement. I'm gonna tell you about a client I had named Dave and Dave ran a sporting uh, education shop, brick and mortar store. And I met him in the middle of the year and he was struggling um, with his business performance up to that year. And he wasn't sure why. So 
Dave says, Forrest, I need your help. Let me hire you for a day. Come in, look at my business, look at my books and tell me what's going on here. I can't quite figure it out. So I go into the, the business and he's showing me around and we finally get to the, the financials analysis and he gives them to me and I spend about an hour going through the, the summaries. And then I noticed there was something that didn't seem right. So I go line by line, by line, by line, by line, checking, um, checking the numbers. And turns out Dave thought he had made a profit the prior year, but in fact, he actually suffered a mild loss. And that guided his whole decision-making in the current year down the wrong track. And it shocked Dave, uh, but we implemented some changes to make sure, okay, let's stop hemorrhaging money here and let's do whatever we got to do to succeed and get to where you want to go, which is money in your pocket, bottom line, profiting first, all that good stuff that's there. So key takeaway with um, this story is, you know, in, inadequate tracking and planning really um, is preventable. Like Donald said, you don't want to end at, go to the end of the year and just dump a bunch of papers on your accountant's lap. We can take advantage and get a system in place, keep our books up to date, and that'll help out with not just taxes, but business strategy. So this is my final um, slide with uh, some good takeaways here. So simple tools to succeed. Number one, determine your goals. Like, What do you want out of your business? Um, how much money is this, does it look like for it to be a success? How much money are you putting in your pocket that makes it look like success? Number two, set up your maps and track your cash flow. I'm talking about your balance sheet, your income statement. You might need other dashboards. Depending on what business you're in, you might need to create, be creative and create some specific tools for that business. Uh, three, set sales targets and expense budget. Use the appropriate pricing model. This is another one that I help a lot of clients with is, okay, well, if you want to put X number of dollars in your pocket at the end of the year, how much in sales do you need? And what are the prices of your products or services that are going to get you to that goal? And just having like a pro forma sort of um, system in place to be constantly iterating on that. Speaking of iteration, number point number four, we view on a periodic basis, monthly, quarterly, annually, all these Timeframes are super valuable. Um, obviously, you can do uh, some stuff monthly, um, but it might only be a, a little bit. And then maybe on the quarterly ones, you, you bulk in some more important stuff. And then obviously annually, um, that is the big, big kahuna right there. Your annual review, super important. Um, five, implement tactical changes when necessary. You know, it's be flexible here. Um, Let's, let's uh, take learning and iterative process seriously. And one, the final point, the thing that helps with that is build a team of experts, get counsel on critical business decisions, could be related to tax planning, legal structure, financing, organizational development, whatever. I know Matthew um, focuses on the tax planning. You got Donald, he's got all the real estate financing. I'm more of generic business consultant. If you have um, issues in the operations, uh, some sort of problem like that. That's why people come to me. So this is Richard Blankenship. He's a client I've had um, in regards to personal financial education. And he says, I've struggled with the concept of money as a currency that flows in and flows out of my life for over 20 years. Before I met Forrest to organize my finances, I was paralyzed to even look at my accounts and assess the situation. These lessons have been amazing. Thank you, Forrest, for your patience, dedication to helping others break free from their self-imposed limitations and broadening the minds and futures of your students. With saturated gratitude, I thank you for your model, your time, and your insight. So my point was sharing uh, this story about Richard. Um, I helped him, you know, just implement basic tools. Um, it wasn't even like, uh, it was a small fraction of um, what I have to offer to my clients, but it made a big, big impact. And he went from being blind to having control. And he just felt the security of that um, just really, really valuable, um, sleeping better at night and all that sort of stuff. So if you have any questions, you can type in in the chat or you can schedule a free call with me. Simplewealth.solutions is my website. Um, feel free to email me at info at simplewealth.solutions. And honestly, I think all three of us that are speaking today, like we just really enjoy helping people and that's why we're here. So again, thank you, Donald. And I know Matthew is coming up and yeah, thank you guys for listening. and. Get excited for Matthew. All right, I'm gonna, 
unmute Donald. All right. Thank you, Forrest. I think you shared a lot of good information. Uh, passed over. You got to make me the host again so I can make Matthew the host so he can share his screen. Um, hey, if, every, if, if you learned something so far in this webinar, please drop a one in the comment section uh, right now. Uh, just drop a one for us because if you learn something from myself, you learn something from Forrest, um, and it was worth your time to be here tonight. Please drop a one. Um, so a lot of people when they when they wanted to uh, when I when I said hey let's do this webinar, a lot of people wanted to know about the specific tax benefits of real estate. So we've got you know our our, our special CPA Matthew. Uh, Malik in the house. Um, he's an investor. Um, he uh, he also uh, you know is is a, is a recently licensed CPA. Uh, he has a lot of knowledge, you know, um, and he's gaining even more and more daily in experience. You know how how me and Matthew got connected really was I put on my Instagram that hey, is anybody know anything about PLs and books? And I've been in the business nine ten years, and I'm trying to still get this part of my business uh, you know situated. And he's like, man, I do. We scheduled a Zoom call. He broke down some things to me on how to get to my NOI. And uh, ever since then, you know, we we birthed this idea of doing this this class and just teaching people. And Forrest was just a great, great addition, as you can see. He has so much experience in the space. Thank you so much for Forrest, Forrest for sharing. I learned so much about how to run a business system, but more importantly, uh, P and L, profit and loss statement. Matthew, man, I'm about to make you the host. Um, I'm gonna have you uh, jump on here and just start educating the people. Um, give me a second to uh, to work this out real quick. To get you, make you the host here, so you can share. Uh, seems like I do this and then I forget. <laughs> All right, here you go, Matthew. How are you, man? All right, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to say thanks for everyone sticking around. Um, I saw a lot of ones in the chat, so. I'm glad you guys are getting a lot of value from this. And um, that's pretty much basically what I want to do. I mean, I met Donald. I'm not sure exactly how I met him, but we, we met. And then, um, he, I mean, I think it's from the real estate events he throws. And um, basically, we met and we've just been good friends. And I want to basically give back value to the community since he gives so much out. So let me start by sharing my screen and, and start with my presentation. All right, everyone see my screen? Thumbs up. All right, cool. Let me go to the slideshow. So as I was saying, who am I? So I actually um, graduated from Miami University in 2019. There I got a um, finance and accounting. I was a double major and I was able to get all my 150 credit hours <clears throat> before graduating within the four years. Um, to enable me to sit for my CPA exam. So that was really um, useful. And then even during college, I had a start in real estate. So I started out as a real estate agent or a real estate like leasing property, man, uh, leasing agent. And then um, I worked under like a property manager and an assistant property manager. And um, basically I started to learn those roles and figure out like um, if real estate was a good fit for me. And even before that, I was still interested in real estate. And I guess to my next slide or next point, which is I'm a licensed real estate agent. So I always had an interest in real estate. And that's why I decided to get that license. And then, like I said, I was a licensed uh, certified public account. And I'm also a real estate and crypto investor. So like Don was saying, like when you're trying to find someone uh, like a good accountant, you do want to have a good accountant who actually has knowledge and experience within the industry that you're working in because every industry has um, different complexities <clears throat> and lastly i'm a business owner and entrepreneur i uh, currently um, in my in am in my house hack um, and that's my first property that i've currently invested in <clears throat> oh yeah if you guys want to shoot me a follow on instagram my name's uh, Cashflow Matthew on there. So why real estate? Um, if you guys have read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or um, heard of Robert Kiyosaki, he basically gives out this quadrant, um, which is like on the top, you have the employees and the business owners. And then on the bottom, you have self-employed and investors. So you want to be on the right side of the quadrant 
in order to have your money like work for you. So one of the reasons real estate is a great business is because it is a cash flowing business. So every month on the first, like clockwork, your tenants have to pay you um, their specified rent, which is in the lease agreement. Um, the next the next benefit is that it is an appreciation asset. So real estate is constrained by um, supply demand, supply. So the population growth can be exponential and that's going to grow and grow, which means more people are going to be fighting for those houses. That's why the prices of like real estate and houses are going up. It's not just because sellers want to sell it for more. It's because more people are bidding over the same piece of land and the same piece of property. Another great reason is it offers debt financing. So like, for example, if you go to buy a stock, most people aren't going to be able to use or leverage debt to purchase that asset. Whereas with real estate, the bank will loan you a, a high amount up to like 95, even even 100%, really, you can get other people to finance and do hard money loans and private lending. There's so many financing opportunities available in real estate to where you can really get started for no money down. And then lastly, um, which you guys are probably most excited for, for are the tax benefits. Um, real estate does provide a lot of um, opportunities to reduce your taxable income. And that is through uh, depreciation, which we'll get through in the next uh, slides. <clears throat> and then just going back on this quadrant. So if you do purchase real estate, I mean, you automatically become an investor. And then you also have the opportunity to become a business owner if you manage your property yourself or um, depending on basically how you want to manage it. But it does get you on the right side of the quadrant. So that's definitely a first step towards wealth creation. Uh, a quote by um, Robert Kiyosaki is real estate investing, even on a small scale, remains a tried and true means of building an individual's cash flow and wealth. So like everyone was touching upon earlier, real estate is like your first foot in the door. And another quote by Donald Trump, real estate is at the core of every business. It's certainly at the core of most people's wealth. So I've, I've heard like estimates and statistics out there that like 80, over 80% 80 of like millionaires come from real estate and, or have their wealth primarily in real estate. So if you do want to become wealthy, knowing about real estate is definitely useful because it's involved in almost every trade. So we'll get into the tax benefits and incentives. So the primary one is just your normal operating expenses. So everything that goes along with owning property, which is a lot more than you think until you really own your property. Like earlier today, I was getting my lawn cut. I had to get the lawn mower and all the power tools for that. So there's a lot of tools that you end up needing to purchase when you're in um, real estate, whether you want to like fix stuff yourself or just handle everything. And then uh, another, another big one is travel. That's why you got the truck up there. So we'll get more into another like type of deduction we can take for vehicles specifically. But every um, all your travel, that is tax deductible towards um, your expenses in your business. So if you have to travel from your house to your property or um, you even need to go fly over to like one of your business um, partners to talk about real estate, that can be potentially tax deductible. And then you can see the list over there. There's so many, so many expenses that are involved in real estate. Like you'd be buying things you never think you needed, but you do. <laughs> oh, and then also business meals, home office deduction, a, a lot of good things in there. Uh, primarily, like I would say the most, most like um, the biggest ones are like your interest expense because most people, get their property financed. So that's a big one. And then lastly, um, the uh, depreciation, which we'll get into in the, in the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, depreciation is primarily one of the best benefits of real estate. So when you purchase a building, 
Um, you're able to normally depreciate that over 27.5 years for a residential, or if you're into commercial real estate, that's 39 years. But if you get a cost segregation study, if you look at this slide over here, it lets you pretty much take your depreciation, your um, all your tax benefits in the earlier years of um, you owning it. So you can see like, um, it really, you, you basically are like speeding up like your depreciate, uh, your tax benefits. And that helps you because that will, um, I mean, lower your taxable income and help you save on taxes versus having it taken straight line 20 over 27 and a half years. Um, another thing is bonus depreciation. So recently with the new tax, um, tax changes, there's a code in the law that says like, which is section 179. And that allows you to depreciate property that you normally would have um, basically depreciated over 15 years in all at once in the first year. So, so say I bought like equipment for my business, like computers or other power equipment, instead of having to depreciate that over 15 years. So like say it was 10,000 and it was over 15 years, I would just be able to take that whole $10,000 write off in the year I purchased it. And then you can see over here in the examples, basically how that's able to translate into tax savings. My next slide. <clears throat> So real estate is a qualified business. So you are able to get an entity pass-through deduction of 20%. And um, another thing is it also has very advantageous um, tax rates. So when you when you sell like a property, you can either be um, taxed on a short-term or a long-term basis. But if you own it for over a year, you uh, it automatically puts you into the long-term rate. And then you can see the rates for um, long-term versus short-term are definitely favorable. And then there's also other, other loopholes, I would say. So for example, if you live in your property two, in the, two years out of the five, you're able to exclude up to $250,000 of that um, capital gain if you're single or 500 if you're married. And then also, um, there's also possibilities to use a 1031 exchange, which is basically you're trading real estate for another piece of real estate. So like when you sell a house, if you don't wanna take the, I guess the profits or you need to take the, you take the profits and then you put it into the next piece of real estate that the IRS will allow you to not have to pay taxes on that because it's a like kind exchange. And then finally, my last slide is going back over what Forrest was saying. It's really important to keep proper bookkeeping because it'll keep you, it'll give you an eye into your business and it'll tell you how you're doing live and it'll prepare financial statements, which will help out your uh, accountant when it comes to your end tax filing. And then lastly, going back to what Don was saying, it does help your credit worthiness when you're going to finance in with the banks, because they are going to look at your financial statements and your tax returns to see if everything verifies. But yeah, that's the end of my presentation. I can shoot it back to you, Donald. Hey, Matthew, man, thanks. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I think that was powerful, as well as uh, if any everybody that uh, got some value out of those uh, tax benefits of real estate, can you drop a two in the comment section for me? Uh, everybody just drop a two in the comment section. I appreciate that, Adrian and Ty, Margaret, appreciate that, MK. Thank you so much. I just want to make sure that, you know, this, this type of information that we provided was just meaty enough, but still yet simple, right? Still yet keeping the concept simple because, you know, I did my first 1031 exchange uh, last summer, right? Knew about it for years. Um, you know, I personally did one. I've seen my clients and helped them do it, but it was really cool to actually see it and, and, and do it. And now I'm dealing with the tax side of it. So uh, for, for the people out there, um, let's, if you got a question uh, from the presentation, uh, 
go ahead and, and drop it in the chat. Uh, I want to make sure we answer some questions before we we, we hop on, um, before, before we hop off of here. Um, as well as um, Adrian did ask earlier, do you specialize in cost segregation studies? And as an investor, when, when can they be used correctly? Uh, Matthew, I want you to answer that as well. I'll chime in on that, but I want you to answer that if you can. Yeah, no, for sure. So, I mean, anytime you purchase a property, you do have the ability to use a cost segregation study. Um, you would want to use it your first year um, that you purchase it. And basically what you're doing is you're assigning a project over to like architects and engineers who will look at your house and um, figure out the materials of that house. And they'll classify it into either like 5, 10, 15 or 27.5 year um, life. And then since most of that, most of your house is constructed with things that aren't gonna last 27.5 years, they'll reclassify it into things that are able to depreciate um, faster and you'll be able to take that bonus um, depreciation we were talking about earlier. So that that's pretty much it. Appreciate that. So Todd asks, how much should I expect to pay a bookkeeper? Hey Forrest, can you answer that one? Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think uh, Robert Kiyosaki talks about it too. Um, a lot of times it's just like, what level are you currently at? Um, you know, you shop around, see what the market's at. And then uh, based on your interviews, you know, hire who you think is going to be the best fit for um, you. I mean, I know Donald, uh, you know, mentioned he's got he found someone on uh, Upwork. I think like that's a you know fair place to start. And then as you grow and um, start scaling, you know, Robert Kiyosaki says you might have to like upgrade and change as you go along. Um, but I mean, like for me and my business needs, I pay like, um, like a small monthly maintenance fee. Um, it's like, you know, I'm at like $30 a month, I think. And then there's just like the big filing fee. It might be a lump sum thing for the tax filings. It might be like 1200 to 2000 bucks. But like, I mean, if I scale and I'm getting bigger, maybe I have to upgrade, but they're good for my level now. You just have to assess where you're at. Um, and maybe Donald has something to add on to that. Yeah. Um, all I was simply saying is uh, I, I like the way you're doing it. Uh, I, I would say that a lot of people's accountants offer that that bookkeeping service as well. And that's what Forrest was mentioning. Uh, for me, I uh, like I said, I didn't have the biggest trust with my different accountants. One, uh, the people I work with now, I have a lot of trust with them. But I've got two bookkeepers, one for the rental property side of my business and another side for the realtor and flipping side of the business. So just I need them to categorize transactions as best as possible because at the end of the year, I don't want to have a lot of issues. Hey, I think Rika had a good question. Um, how do you effectively vet a CPA professional? Man, that's a good one. That's a really good one. Um, you know, Forrest and Matthew, you guys want to weigh on that one before, before I, I weigh in on it? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say just get to know them, uh, meet with them a couple of times in person or um, videos, like over video, and then um, see if that the experience they have um, translates to the experiences you're having in your business. Yeah. Forrest, you got any thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... I think it's just kind of recapping what I was like talking about earlier. It's, it's, you know, you do the best with where you're at. Um, and I think typically when you talk to a few, like three or four, you'll start noticing the patterns and then you'll be led to the person in this unit of time. Like you also have to like trust your intuition and the universe to guide you where necessary. But you know, if it's not working and it's not making you feel good, you know, search for someone that's going to make you feel better. Um, and, and yeah, you'll, you'll notice the patterns. Yeah, so I want to I want to echo what Forrest said, um, and and he said patterns, right? I would say how do they treat you, right? So so what I mean is I've had four or five accountants, and um, when somebody can't answer your call after uh, like so January through May is their busy season, right? So I'm sorry, January through April into April is their busy season, right? And so if they can't answer your phone call or respond to your text or email between May and December, not a not going to be a good relationship, right? Because that just means I don't know what they're doing. Now, look, between January through April, I get if they take a couple of days to get back to me. I understand. They're probably working like, you know, 60, 70 hour weeks trying to get caught up on all kinds of people's stuff. People are blowing them up. And what you want to do, and this has happened to me a couple of times where I'm refinancing properties 
and I need the taxes done. And I had to pay extra to get them done faster. Because, but I'd say if you're prepared, you can have them done and so you can be prepared for opportunity. I think somebody said, you know, luck is where hard work meets opportunity and you want to go ahead and partner those things together. That's why I think having your tax prepared is definitely good. But Rick can answer your question. Definitely focus on how they how you how they treat you, how they respond to you is the biggest thing. I think that comes with any service provider. Um, any any other questions that people may have? Because if not, I'm going to throw a few things out there that uh, I think may help people that are still trying to figure out this part of their life. Because um, I think it's always a work in progress as we grow. Uh, is it possible to refinance if your business shows a loss? Todd, thank you for the question. That's such a good one. Um, in my experience. Um, it's been very difficult to do that, um, to, to have low income um, and, and, and have a loss. I'm going to have uh, uh, Matthew and Forrest, if they want to weigh in on that at all, uh, they can do so. But I, I think that um, if you now, now I will tell you this, I do have a, a friend and partner where he showed a loss on his business income um, because he was flipping a lot, but he had a ton of rentals and he also had a, a really nice W-2 uh, that was paying him really well. So in his case, he was still able to refinance uh, because he has a W-2 that's paying well. And so that's the thing for, for people like myself, uh, generally uh, we're just 1099. So if we don't have a W-2 as well, uh, we don't have, uh, let me explain the difference between a 1099 W-2. Self-employed people, business owners, they're what you call 1099 contractor type employees, even if they're contracted with themselves. A W-2 is where your employer pays you a paycheck and they take out your taxes and they pay them to the government and, and they pay their, their tax to the government and your tax at the same time. It's called a W-2 employee, right? Majority of people and majority of us started out as a W-2 employee. We might've transitioned over to being a 1099, right? So most of my career, I was a 1099, but now I'm a 1099 and I'm a W-2 at the same time. And again, that's a more of a tax strategy thing. And uh, let me see what, uh, what, what Todd, uh, what he said is it, what if you have a week have a week of W-2? What about if you have a week of W-2? I don't know about a week, man. I think you need maybe 12 months uh, or six months. But I will tell you, there are some lenders out there that right now that are doing DSCR loans, which that means debt service coverage ratio loans. What that means is the property is cash flowing and it covers a certain amount over what the mortgage is going to be. They'll do the loan, but it's going to be higher interest rate. So there are options out there. But again, you know, these options ebb and flow. When we, when, in the in in a recessionary market that I grew up in, essentially in the business, these loans weren't really available because they were available prior to 2008, and they didn't they haven't they didn't come back into the last 12 to 24 months, sometimes 36 months, because some of the hard money lenders were offering them. Now some uh, institutional uh, bankers, I don't want to say bankers, but institutional mortgage shops are offering these type of loans. Um, let's see what what else somebody said. How much of a difference? Is LLC mortgage rates to buying a home for refinancing? David, I think I got to answer that one for you. Um, when it comes to uh, the LLC mortgage rates, that means when you're refinancing in a business versus buying a traditional home. So majority business loans are not even 30 years. So I got a couple of commercial loans. Some are 20 years, some are 25 year amortizations, right? But they're a 10 year loan. Like my loan period is for 20 or 25 years but I only have a loan for 10 years and then I have to either refinance or re-up the loan at that point in time. So usually when you're doing commercial loans or LLC loans, as you called it in, in your question, David, they're a little bit more complex and the bank doesn't give you as much leeway. When it comes to owner occupants, they're giving you 30 years. So right now I think we're at like 4.75 up to five, up to 5%, maybe 4.5 to 5%, depending on the day. And then on the commercial loan side, um, five and a half up to six percent so it's like usually one percent higher than than that rate um let's see mk said is it better to start a business for real estate purposes for tax or loans or other reasons or use an existing 20 year old consulting business that i can make into a real estate business man i love that one uh forrest man what are, you, what are your thoughts on that uh yeah i think i've heard um different people uh suggest um things on this. Uh, I think it depends on what type of real estate you're, you're doing. Like some people are creating an LLC per apartment complex. So if it's a bigger thing, and then other people are recommending, well, if you're just collecting single family homes, just 
you want to LLC until it grows to a significant size just to keep it simpler. So if you analyze what specifically are you trying to acquire as far as real estate assets, that might guide you. And then how you can always create a new one. Um, but how much is that old LLC, how much advantage are you going to get out of using that? Is that, are you going to get a lot more credit like extended if you use that LLC? If so, maybe it's worth considering, but if it doesn't give you that, I'm not sure uh, why you wouldn't just make a new LLC for the real estate that might be an easier, clean start. So hopefully that helps. You guys have anything on that one? Yeah, of course. I think you hit it on the nail. Um, like if you do have the existing business, you might be able um, to get like better credit or financing. Um, but you would need to speak to like a legal expert because if you do use a previous LLC, you might be um, exposed to liability. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. But I, I definitely appreciate that one. And I definitely advise you to have more than one LLC. Um, Ellis uh, said, would you need a real estate license to start buying property or would an LLC slash S Corp be good enough? Matthew, you answer that one, brother. Yeah, no, I mean, you definitely should use an LLC to purchase property. Um, the second part of the question or cat and cash flow under a corp or LLC. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, an LLC definitely helps limit liability, helps with tax purposes. So I would suggest to buy an LLC, but you don't necessarily are, are to use an LLC, but you definitely don't need to use a different LLC for each property. Some people do do that, but... Uh, I've worked with investors who have tens of millions of dollars in one LLC. So it's definitely up to you. Um, so David asked, should you buy an LLC for each property and cash flow under a corp or LLC? Uh, Forrest, you got any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, one of my thoughts is, uh, Donald, you have to do another one of these and get a lawyer on here. I will. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a legal expert, but I've seen um, people advise both of uh, like that specific model where you basically have like your property management company um, and then you start putting like all these other LLCs wrapped in like a Wyoming holding company. And then like you can get like pretty fancy asset protection stuff going on, but you're going to pay for like you have to pay a firm to like set that stuff up for you. Um, so some people just leg into it in a smaller sort of capacity um, and keep it simpler. Um, I'm not a legal expert, uh, but that's kind of what I've, I've observed from lawyers. Yeah. And David, really, that's up to the amount of risk you can handle. Some some of the guys that got a lot of real estate, they do four or five properties per LLC. It depends on how much risk they can handle, you know. Uh, so MK said pros and cons of S Corp versus LLC for taxes. Matthew, weigh in on that one for us. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, I actually just helped Michael Yasses file for his S-Corp. So he converted his LLC into an S-Corp. And basically what it is, it's just a tax classification. Um, it's still a pass-through entity. One of the benefits basically to using an S-Corp is that there's no self-employment tax. So if you do hire yourself, you're able to um, mitigate those taxes. And that's what he did. He would do a lot of work on his own projects. So if you, if you're salaried in your own business, then definitely switch to an uh, S corp, um, because that'll save you a lot in, um, taxes. Hey, so we're, we're, we're I'm about to, an, an, we're about to get Andrew, I'm um, sorry, Adrian's question answered, but if you guys are really um, getting some information and really learning from tonight, please drop a three in the comment section for me. Let me know that you're, you're learning something. Um, as well as I want to just kind of drop in this too, is that um, I'm going to host another class next month. Um, we're going to talk about credit and then we're going to get back to the attorneys and LLCs as well. It'll be, it'll, it'll be on credit or LLC structure, but I think I'm going to want to do one on credit uh, and talk about credit as well. Um, as well as um, the next uh, elevated event is going to be May 19th. So mark your calendar for that, seven to nine, standard live. And actually at that event, uh, me and the other guys are going to be speaking <laughs> individually about the things that we do. Um, and, 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 and we're going to be speaking at that event. So let me get to Adrian's question here real quick. When does an LLC outweigh an umbrella policy as an investor? Forrest, I think that's something you can speak on, man. Um, yeah, an LLC outweigh an umbrella 
policy. I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what uh, you're referring to. Maybe you understand better than me, but is that like if you have like multiple underneath the um, umbrella property um, management company, is, is that what you're referring to specifically or? Yeah, a Adrian, you wanted to speak on that one. Um, uh, Cause I mean, I was thinking about it from a, a, a insurance standpoint, right? Right. Uh, having an LLC versus having an umbrella insurance policy. Um, I think that you should have both, you know, and I think you should always have an insurance umbrella policy. They're not expensive to get from your local insurance provider. Um, I just think it's, it's definitely a good thing to have just in case something pops up or happens. Um, should the LLC be set up in a low tax state like Delaware, Nevada, et cetera, or just in Ohio? That's what MK said. Uh, Forrest, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I've heard people saying different stuff on this one as well. And I mean, Donald, I know you invest in Ohio. I think a lot of people say if the property is in Ohio, you should be having the LLC in Ohio and doing like the, the out of state LLCs is like extra complicated. So you'll need someone who really knows that stuff if you wanted to go down that route. And um, I'm not sure it's it's worth it. You have to like really analyze that. And it's probably easier to set up in Ohio, but um, what do you guys think about that, Donald? Yeah, yeah. You, you know what, Forrest, you, you kind of said it. I do. I probably should do the next one with an attorney because there's so many questions on here about LLCs and liability and stuff like that. And I might have to get an insurance person and, and an attorney on the next one because uh, I think that's who uh, people really want to hear from. Then we'll do credit after that. Matthew, you got any, you got any thoughts on uh, where, where to set the best place to set up LLCs or, or just doing it in Ohio versus not? From a tax perspective, um, I mean, I would just suggest you do it like in your primary place of business or where you reside. From a tax perspective, I'm not sure if there really are that many benefits because ultimately the taxes from the LLC do flow through to your individual tax return. And that's going to be based um, on your tax bracket. So um, I don't think it should like provide that much of a benefit. Yeah. So, so here's what I do know about that. Cause I, I definitely understand what you guys are saying. Uh, I know about Las Vegas. I know about Delaware, I know about Wyoming places that people are, are filing these um, uh, LOCs and then doing them in Columbus uh, or sorry, doing them in Ohio as a, as a foreign uh, entity. Uh, the main reason for that is that people are concerned about the corporate veil being pierced, like their identity being found out in Ohio. It's only ever happened twice. So I don't think there's a really a lot of concern for that. I think it's more or less how you operate your business that that ultimately gets you in trouble with that cor that, that that corporate veil. So I mainly just I mainly just use Ohio LLCs at this time. In the future, that could change. I don't know. Um, you know, the bigger you get, maybe you, you need that extra protection by being in those different states. But those different states that I mentioned, a lot of reasons why people were doing that is for certain type of businesses, like Delaware specifically is strong for banks. Uh, when it comes to their how they set up their businesses so it's just different places different things um so okay so with that being said guys i want to honor everybody's time and also want to thank you for coming out tonight if um if you if you want to attend if you if you think that having another event uh where we talk specifically about um uh corporate structures and things like that asset protection uh please put a one in the chat for me and um with that being said, in about another minute or two, I'm gonna shut it out, but I also want to say thank you again. If Matthew or Forrest want to say anything else uh, before we close out, I want them to go ahead and take the floor, but I want to thank everybody again for coming out. And then um, if we have another one, please tell your friends, please tell the people you got value out of this and uh, have them have them join us for the, for the next one. Yeah, I'll just keep it quick. Like, thank you, Donald. Thank you, Matthew, and everyone who came out tonight. Um, seems like some people got some value out of it. So uh, I'll, I'll Talk it up as a success. Thank you guys. Yeah, definitely. Thank you guys. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to hit me up on social media. I'll definitely help as many as you uh, as possible. And thanks for Donald for hosting this. Guys, thank you again, everybody. Thank you so much. We'll see you uh, May 6th, May 19th uh, for the next Elevate event. And then obviously it sounds like we're going to do, do another one of these classes and host one on asset protection. Everybody have a good night. And uh, thanks so much. I'm actually going to send out an email with this recording as well so that you guys can uh, rewatch it and, and hopefully learn more. All right. Get, God bless you and your, and your investment endeavors. Have a good night.